Yes. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm really glad to be here. And today I'll talk about cell polarity and how we believe this view and focus on cell polarity can uh, make uh, biology simple again. So um, basically a dream of mine is go and find that level of description where all this apparent complexity and tremendous diversity of biological uh, shapes and patterns can be explained by a few simple rules. And I hope that by the end of this talk, maybe you'll get at least more, a little bit more convinced that uh, such thing is possible. So um, my journey kind of on this path started from interaction with our uh, developmental biologist collaborator. He's also a stem cell biologist. And he basically asked us to help to understand um, the numbers he gets behind uh, some apoptosis, so self-committing uh, suicide in a particular stage of uh, early embryo development. And uh, we kind of tried to find a shortcut and then make a simple model of it, but we could not find our way around and actually build the model from the beginning up to this end stage where, I'll just find the pointer, uh, where the embryo is actually rather complicated, right? So just to give you a little bit of a feeling how the embryo develops, it starts, the time counting starts at fertilization, it starts as one cell, then uh, until two and a half days, and now we're talking about mice, cells just divide without really taking any decisions. Uh, at around three days, outer cells get polarized, so they get also a certain fate, they eventually will become placenta. And uh, at about this stage, half a day later, they form a cavity. So the cells inside move to one side and there is forming a cavity filled with liquid. And as embryo grows, number of cells is increasing both outside and inside as inner cells start getting different fates. And so they actually start forming cell types that eventually will go and form an embryo. These are the green cells and they become um, so they get another fate, which is kind of supporting, has a supporting function. And for example, yolk sac, this would suck. This would be the red cells. And the, uh, in another half a day, uh, these cells segregate into this very beautiful pattern where the green cells are all encapsulated inside and uh, patterned by uh, red cells on the, on the surface with this cavity. So they form these three distinct layers. And now there is this very, uh, 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 amazing observation is that if you start at around day two, when there are four cells, eight cells, or even earlier, two cells, you could basically cut the embryo in half. You can even take one cell out of, the, of those uh, clump of cells, and you can form the embryo of exactly the same pattern as we see here, day four and a half. So this, this process is to be really robust. The only thing is that uh, this embryo will be uh, smaller, right, accordingly smaller. So if you take half, it will be half the size. If you take a quarter, it will be quarter of a size. So it has, it can scale. Even more amazing, you can take two uh, embryos a day, two and a half, push them together, it will form one embryo of double the size, but exactly the same pattern. But then we kind of wanted to understand how come it turns out to be so successful every time. Basically, there is a estimated to be more than 90% of success uh, chance to get to that pattern by four and a half days. How come it's so robust, right? I mean, basically you can do whatever with it and it, it can still make the right pattern. And then what's even more amazing is that it does not seem to be in the genes because uh, if you look at the mammalian, they get exactly the same pattern, exactly the same shape, same properties, but then regulatory network, genes are quite different. So it seems to be that the similarity has to be on some high level. And well, we had to build a model and uh, you could see the realization of this model to the left here. So this is not just a cartoon, it's real model running. Um, and I'll just make the story short. We managed to do it uh, through four simple rules. So we kind of try to identify what are the key components to get to this end part pattern to start with. And it turns out that what was really important is this fact that these outer cells, they were gaining cell polarity. And I'll talk the rest of my talk more about it. But that, 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 that feature really allowed the cavity formation in a robust way. Then it seems that to uh, get the right cell proportions between the green and the red cells, cells seem to play this minority game. And in a short, it's really that they're looping around. So they're deciding to become a certain fate. And when they're deciding it, they're looking around and choosing the fate opposite to the majority of the neighbors. And I mean, we can go into molecular details how this is done, but this is literally just a subcellular toggle switch between genetic regulatory switch, uh, which excludes the fates. And then there is a negative feedback between the cells. 
And then, then you get the salt and pepper pattern, but of cells of right proportion. And then it seems like the simple differential adhesion, which is probably very familiar to many of us with two parameters can be sufficient to explain the segregation into three layers. So uh, green cells, they basically prefer to adhere to each other more than the red cells. This will already will push red cells outside. And there is a little bit of preference of green cells to go to the blue cells. And uh, what it turns out that it's not always forming a perfect structure. Sometimes the red cells get trapped inside. And um, uh, when that cell, cell is trapped inside, we say that cells commit suicide because they actually get uh, biological cues for that. And that's what our collaborator was after. So it seems that with these four rather simple rules, of course, we mined a huge uh, volume of biological literature to converge to these rules. But all in all, it seems to be sufficient to reproduce these embryos uh, uh, successfully. And if we actually went and took all the existing numbers on cell proportions, on all the perturbations that people can do, for example, when they're playing this minority game, we can, I'm not showing it here again for the, for the purpose of time, but we can basically match all the quantitative results within the error bars. We can also reproduce the embryo scaling. We can do all the separations in the model and reproduce it. So we're really inspired by this success and um, kind of thought that, well, maybe it's true. Maybe there are the simple rules that can generate this robustness and um, complexity. So, while giving not only qualitative agreement, but also quantitative agreements with the experiments. And this work was primarily done with uh, by, by still as Boris um, Now he's a postdoc at Stanford. Uh, and uh, we had collaborated with Kim Snap and Moons and the main uh, experimental collaborator, Joshua Brickman, with his lab uh, here also in Copenhagen. But then this work inspired us to ask this question of, well, it looks like the scaling, right? You can put them together, you can take it apart, and it seems to really converge to the same pattern in this early embryo development. But the structure itself was not so complex, right? It was kind of a sphere with some, some organized core, but still it was spherical symmetric. What about these other organs that have much more complicated structure, right? If you think of infants, they get this, first of all, of course, they have to form this complex structure, but then how come that it can scale? And, and, and be so robust in that. Also, we know that in some of the organs, there is a huge turnover of the cells and they can still keep that shape, those shapes. And then given that it can be so robust, how come it's so flexible to create this diversity of shapes, right? Where, where does this diversity come from? Like how come that it um, can be so different at the same time? And here, uh, here basically one can um, get back to this experience that if you look back long enough, you can basically find someone having ideas or solutions for your problems. And here I, I, I suggest we turn back to Kepler, in, uh, who in 1611, as story goes, was walking on the bridge, the snow was falling, and he asked himself, how come that the snowflakes, they have these six corners all the time, but not a single snowflakes look like the other one. So we have this tremendous diversity, there is some symmetry in it that's preserved, but otherwise you get this huge diversity. And already at that time, he had a very right intuition. He was thinking that this has to be something about the symmetries of the constituents of the snowflakes. And in the end, it's true. So basically the six fold of the water molecules, six fold symmetry explains the fact that there are six uh, corners, but the actual shape seems to be dependent on the initial condition where the snowflakes were forming and the particular path the snowflake was taking, like what temperatures, what pressures it went through and every, uh, path seems to be different because I'm basically uh, stochastic in it. So it seems that initial and boundary conditions can assure for the diversity in this particular scenario, but there is this symmetry in internal system on microscopic scale can kind of also reflect into the symmetries on the macroscopic scale. So now the question, could it be that something similar is going on in the development? And now we're looking, uh, so we talked about embryo development, right? We show that uh, we know that these first three days, it Kind of cells divide and they all stuck together in this globular structure. So they stick on all sides. And then later on, they form this, there was this cavity forming. So they form this spherical structure. So the sphery spherical symmetry appears. And then later on, the typical scenario is that you develop, you break symmetry one more time and you start getting this head tail axis or like forming the gut, right? So you start making tube and get this axial symmetry symmetries. And um, well, then the question is, these are macroscopic symmetry breakings. Are there any microscopic? And if we look at the cells, 
It seems that each of these transitions indeed is accompanied by symmetry breaking on a cellular level. Uh, when, uh, when the embryos go from this globular structure to spherical, uh, cells gain apical basal polarity. So that basically means that some proteins uh, mutually exclude each other and localize to the opposite sides of the cell. And you should think about, if we think about the skin on our hands, for example, that would be inside outside polarity. So for example, this blue part will be outside of the skin, uh, white part in, inside of the skin. Now, when we have the second symmetry breaking on the uh, microscopic scale, when we get the tubes and the, and the axial symmetry, it seems to coincide with the second symmetry breaking on the cellular level. And cells gain this planar cell polarity that's now orthogonal to the first one. So let's think on the apical side, now other two pairs of proteins are mutually excluding and localized to their other poles or opposite sides of the cell. So now the question is, could it be that um, the symmetry breaking in cells is actually what is responsible for the macroscopic shapes and changes in the macroscopic shapes? And in addition to that, would the cellular polarity be sufficient to robustly maintain the shapes, right? For example, scale, but also how much diversity can it really assure? Because we only have two polarity, break, um, two, pol uh, two, two polarity types. So to address this, we uh, turn to the model. And um, so, so in, in the field of morphogenesis, morphological shapes, there is uh, a, a big attention to the vertex-based models. Uh, we decided to take the alternative path because we wanted to minimize number of parameters. So we just view cells as particles. And these particles interact through this short range repulsion, long range uh, attraction potential. So you can think about um, uh, van, van der Waals potential, right? The only thing is that we didn't use van der Waals potential, we used these exponentials uh, because it was softer, it was easier to relax to a global minimum. So think of this as a phenomenological way of describing how cells are sticky and how they stick to each other. And with this very simple interaction potential, uh, you can write an uh, equation of motion, assuming this overdone system, so that this would be the force keeping cells together and we add a little bit of noise in order to have the system frozen. And uh, so this is kind of what could explain this very simple globular pattern, right? Just sticky cells, there is nothing uh, surprising about it. Now, what about the polarity? How do we take care of it? And polarity means that there is kind of polarized adhesion. And if we can go back to biology and think about how this polarized adhesion is happening, what's happening is that cells, if you think of them as spheres, they have their adhesion along the equator of the cell. So if you think of cells being balls, if there is no polarized adhesion, there would be Velcro all around on all the cells and they will just stuck all, all the way around. Whereas if you have polarized adhesion, then the Velcro is only on the equators, right? So now, of course, if you throw the cells together, they will form a plane the way they're gonna stick to each other. And um, that basically means that there is a couple of uh, constraints, what, how these vectors are oriented relative to each other and relative to the displacement vector. And that means that basically they are parallel to each other and orthogonal to the displacement vector of their neighbors. And this is what we are putting in the model. So this was our classical potential. And now we just make it such that depending on the uh, orientation of these polarities, we want to minimize this uh, potential where apical basal polarities are parallel to each other and orthogonal to the vector. And basically these cross products, right? So if this is one, when the polarity is orthogonal to the displacement vector, and then you take the nearest neighbor, if that is also orthogonal and they're parallel to each other, this will be the maximal attraction. So that means that if they are in this configuration, they will have a maximal attraction. If now, for example, they are orienting in the opposite direction, there will be repulsion as well, because this term becomes negative and the entire thing, this S1 becomes negative and the entire thing is positive. So with this very simple um, setup, of course, then we need to calculate the potential acting on a single particle. So we need to define which cells are the neighbors. And here we can either use the simple Voronoi neighborhood definition, or you can use some sort of cutoff. It doesn't really matter. Some, sense, some things are more uh, sensitive to this, some less, but the main results are gonna hold no matter the neighborhood. So um, with this definition of but in a neighborhood, we then ask, okay, what about the stability? What can these polarities do? So we started with a thousand or maybe 10,000 particles here 
uh, with polarities oriented in a random direction, and then just relaxed and started seeing what happens to the system, right? Can it, will it just turn into a sphere, right? It would be the most obvious uh, case. And uh, could it scale, would it be robust enough? And it turns out that as the system relaxes, of course, locally it tries to make these planes, right? Because you are optimizing cells pointing their polarities parallel to each other. But you can see that the complexity seems to be preserving and uh, I'll just sell it short, I'm selling it short. The complexity will stay there. It will be a metastable structure and has this um, ability of, um, for example, here, there is this hole and we have only nearest neighbors interactions. But what you're going to see is that it's kind of healing here only through this nearest neighbor interactions. It can zip and, and make this very smooth uh, channel-like, fold-like shapes. So complexity is there uh, and that's great. And obviously the particular realization how these channels and tubes are gonna look like will depend on the initial conditions, right? Because this is how our initial polarities were pointing out. So diversity from initial conditions is already in place and we can confirm it more. I'm just not gonna show it. Now, this is just to show that this is metastable state because our energy is somewhat higher than the energy of a sphere, which is the minimum here. And we run it, this is time in a logarithmical scale, we'll run it quite long and it's still stable for basically whatever we could run it for. Uh, this is just to show that there is some, in principle, uh, experimental analogs where people can uh, grow brain organoids with the polarized cells. I'm not saying this is equivalent, but there is a place where one can start and start sort of doing comparisons and perturbations and start seeing how far we can put the similarities of this model to the in vitro systems. Now, what about the scaling? Would this particular uh, setup allow for the robust scaling, right? We talked about the infant heart complicated structure growing up and not changing in shape. And it seems that it scales pretty fine. Uh, we can grow it from 8,000 to 25,000 cells and the overall shape, I mean, actually all the details are preserved, it's just scaling in size, right? Good. And uh, then of course you could ask, well, it's sensitive to initial conditions. Possibly it's also going to be very sensitive to the noise. We have this noise term, but overall what you can see if when we run to them, when we run with the noise that's basically at the maximum, higher than the noise we tried, the whole structure just falls apart. So as long as they stay together, there are overall quite a lot of preservation of structures. If you just think about this uh, channel going here, you'll see it here as well. So there is this, and then there is this channel, that there is a little bit of similar differences, but overall structure is in place, even with the noise. So overall, we can make this conclusion that indeed these polar interactions can allow for the robust structures, they uh, can scale, and it really seems that this diversity can be uh, driven by just differences in the initial or whatever other boundary conditions, like you put some clues, you fix polarities in a certain direction, that could affect your eventual topologies. So stable and unique. And, and here we kind of looked at the spheres and folds, but then what about the tubes? Can, can this polarity explain the tube? Because we talked that, well, we did have the second symmetry breaking, the uh, appearance of this planar cell polarity when the tubes were forming in the embryo. Uh, can we go and see how much can we gain by adding this planar cell polarity? And also experimentally, planar cell polarity, the second one has a very strong phenotype. If it's removed or knocked out, you get less regular tubes and tubes of a bigger diameter. This is a Newton, this is a wild type. So let's see, can we capture that? And uh, basically we proceed in a similar, similar way. Now we say that the cells are vectors, right? So we can, in addition to this polar adhesion based on apical basal polarity. So now we say, if it's only apical basal, it's a Velcro around the equator. Now if we want to add the planar cell adhesion, then this kind of Velcro to the West and the East have different uh, preferences. So the East wants to adhere to the West of the another cell. And to add that, we can again turn to this kind of simplistic way of, of saying that, well, we want first biological observation is that apical basal polarity is orthogonal to planar cell polarity. We can go and maximize our potential when uh, me, I am as a cell having this orthogonality, but I also want to uh, enforce it in the neighboring cells. And it's also based on some biological observation, there is a coupling of these polarities between cells through membrane proteins. But then I also 
The spinous nodularity R again through coupling between the cells, they're also aligning parallel to each other. So we have these two additional terms, uh, one that ensures the polarities are orthogonal to each other, and the other is that spinous nodularities are parallel to each other. So with this in place, we can now go and say, okay, I start with a spherical lumen and I add these two terms. Could I form tubes? And could I explain how maybe weakening some of these planar cell polarities, trying to mimic the experiment, right? Where they remove the planar cell polarities proteins and got wider tubes and less regular. And it turns out that we can. Um, so if we start with the sphere with all these polarities in place, the stronger is the planar cell polarity of fusion, the longer and narrower tubes we get. And this movie to the right is really showing the transition. Here, the important thing is that there's no growth. It's only cell rearrangement. And cell rearranged, basically only driven by the potential that I defined before with three parameters only. And then the relative, our prediction here would be the relative width of the tube is really depending on the relative adhesion strength of how this apical basal adhesion works relative to planar cell polarity adhesion. So how this asymmetry, how strong these asymmetries are in the adhesion. So we could make tubes. And uh, as I said, this is due to cell cell rearrangement. And kind of if we go back to the literature, this is a very well studied phenomena. So in drosophila gastrulation, for example, we know there is this tissue extends through cell rearrangements. T1 junction remodeling is a classical thing appearing there. And this is what we get for free in our system. So this phenomenon seems to be emergent from these phenomenological constraints that we put in the equation, right? So these are three equations, or oh, three parameters, which are basically mathematical formulation of the rules that, that we observe in the biology. And um, not only it can make tube, it can also make branching tubes. I'm not gonna go into detail, but basically slight modification can allow for that. So all in all, both of these polarities can allow for this emergence of convergence extension, stable tubes, and uh, stable tube branching. And here, Julius Kierkegaard joined us. This uh, Silas and Kim were still on the team when we did that work. And uh, so that before we talked about the tubes forming out of spheres, right? Some spherical lumens. And there is, for example, this is what's happening in pancreas. You first form lumens, then you make tubes and these tubes merge. But some of the very important tubes like gut and neural tube, uh, they actually made out of sheets. So you have this first form of sheet and then the sheet wraps or buds to make the tubes. And it seems to be more complicated transitions in some way. So one of the examples of tube budding would be sea urchin gastrulation. It starts with a sphere. And then here at the bottom, it starts invaginating, making the tube growing up and merging with the top of the sea urchin to form a mouth. So basically here on top, there will be a mouth. This is the EM picture, think of that. And here at the bottom is the anus. So it's an example of tube budding. Then we have this tube um, wrapping, right? When the tube is formed parallel to the sheet. And again, this is drosophila gastrulation where the tube is it's invaginating, making the tube inside. So this is a cross-section view. Here will be the tube. The tube is then separates from the sheet itself. And then there's another example is the neurulation where now we're looking at this as being a sheet. It bends up. Uh, the edges are fusing, merging together, and the tube is separating. So the question is, can we now with this, so we can make tubes, right? We can make sheets. Uh, can we now reproduce this phenomenon? What is needed for that? And Hold if we on, you have two minutes, sorry. This... I just wanted to let you know you have two minutes. It's okay. Two minutes, all right, I'm quite close. So in the literature, people often ref uh, uh, focus on the ethical constriction as a mechanism to explain how all this process is happening. But uh, if, if you think about the apical constriction, then basically it has its own limitations because basically uh, uh, if you have isotropic apical constriction, then if you think of cylinder, one end will be narrower than the other. If you put them together, it kind of can only make spherical symmetry. How do you make tubes out of that? So, uh, and of course in 2D models, that's easy, but what about 3D models? So now the question is, can the apical constriction do it or not? And again, our model right now, we only have three parameters, so we can, and the apical constriction, and we have particle models, right? We don't have shapes as such. How do you do uh, apical constriction? And here we can again phenologically capture it, but just favoring a tilt of these vectors relative to each other, because that would correspond to the apical constriction. 
And to make story short, uh, we can do it both uh, isotropically and anisotropically according to what is observed in your relation. And we can recapitulate the tube budding. So if we take, start with the sheet, with the, all this is driven by our potential. The only thing that requires here is that setting particular boundary condition orienting this planet cell polarity on a circle. And you would wonder why and how it can happen. I can answer if there are questions about that. There's some biology that can explain how this happens. Here, it seems that apical constriction is not really helping making it you, but it helps orienting it in a particular direction and maybe increase robustness. More often you get the tube in a shorter period of time, but you don't need that to make a tube. This is also backed up by, by experiments, not done by us, published experiments, but it's there. And uh, the same is with sea urchin. Um, the nice thing here is of course the budding is the same as we saw before, but it can also very nicely merge. As you see it grows right now, there's no growth, cells don't change, it's only rearrangement. It fuses on the top and it automatically makes, makes them out. So it's the first model that can do that. Biologically, people talk about special cells helping, merging, zipping, unzipping. It doesn't seem to be needed, at least if you have just these basic uh, descriptions of cell interactions. And uh, at the same time, we can also do the wrapping, the neurulation. Um, so here for the budding, we really need differential proliferation. Some of the cells have to divide with different rates in the particular regions, also known from experiments. Uh, and for the first time, we actually have a model that can separate the tube from the sheet itself. All right, so um, here uh, it was Bjarke that joined us as well, also from University of Copenhagen. Um, and uh, just to summarize the take home messages, just like this polar cell cell interaction indeed can uh, result in this complex, stable and scale, uh, scalable morphologies. Um, I didn't talk much about it, but it seems like a lot of this experimental observation about buckling and vasculature and organoids can come from non-equilibrium growth. And uh, we can kind of explain a wide variety of these morphological uh, shapes and transitions from basically three four parameter model. And uh, so kind of, I hope that by now, uh, you're a little bit more agreeing with me that there is potential for making biology simple and uh, hopefully describe a wide range of things with the simple models and, and simple rules. Thank you. Thank you, Ola, for a beautiful talk. Uh, if you have any questions, maybe you guys can, you know, unmute yourselves and ask directly. And, you know, I don't see any raised hands. So, okay, there is a question already. Uh, Sarah Liang is asking, how does cell growth and apoptosis play a role in the tube forming model? Yes, so we don't have in, in this particular slide uh, where there was the very original tu tubes forming out of uh, spherical vesicles. There is no cell growth. There is no apoptosis at all. So it's really cell rearrangement. Uh, of course, there is a classical mechanism for tube formation where people talk about oriented cell growth. And uh, we can go into discussion when this can be relevant, when not. Uh, I mean, so if, the, if we're looking at the tube formation on a short time scale, indeed, orient growth would play a role, but the tube will not be stable. Like, I cannot see how the tube could stabilize itself unless it's accompanied with a corresponding changes in the cell shapes that stabilize the tube. Uh, but the growth per se wouldn't result in a stable tube simply because you don't have this asymmetry that would keep it in place. Thank you. I have a quick question about the first part of your talk when you had, you know, the different cells that are differentiated to become dif different types of cells. Were they dividing at the same rate or they were dividing at different rates? Uh, we were assuming that they were dividing the green and the red ones uh, inside the embryo. They were dividing at the same rate. Uh, the blue ones, um, I can't recall, but they are larger, larger than the uh, the cells inside, you can also see that we're kind of using them as ovals. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm pretty sure that we tried to match the growth rate to what has been measured experimentally, okay. but I don't think it was playing an important role that should, there should have been a differential growth. I think growing at the same time would have resulted in the same structures. Thank you. So there is a question from Kimberly Paul, and she's saying, great talk, thank you. You mentioned that initial boundary conditions are important. I may have missed but can you say something about what kinds of different initial conditions you explored in these simulations? 
Right. So um, in, 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 in the case of, uh, for example, this kind of uh, random random organoid growth when we started with particles all in the doo -doo -doo here, right? When we started with particles pointing in the random conditions, we basically just visually sampled three few examples and we arrived to a difference in topology. Ideally, of course, it would be nice and that's a little bit of our plan as well. We just need to find a person interested in, in pursuing that direction. Um, kind of to go and see how much difference in initial conditions are needed to create a large difference in the emerging topologies, right? Where is it sort of to have it in a more quantitative understanding for that? Um, in terms of, um, in terms of, for example, last things I was showing about the tube budding out of the plane, there it was very important that polarities in a certain region of the sheet would be orienting on a circle and point uh, on a circle, a little bit like a swirl. Uh, and this would be, it, it had to be maintained for the entire period of this tube formation. Mm -hmm. And this is also where I said that there is actually biology um, sort of mechanism of how these polarities can be oriented. There are some chemicals con called, um, which are participating in forming the body axis like wind. And, and uh, there were done experiments where you would insert a wind secreting cell in the field of these planet cell polarity cells. And suddenly all the planet cell polarity cells in the neighborhood would start pointing radially away from this wind secreting cell. So there are chemicals, there are ways to kind of point and orient these polarities in a particular place. And we think this would be really uh, kind of what could explain where these tubes are forming. So, so the only thing you will need is placing these wind secretors in a particular point to drive this discontinuity, if you wish, in the, in the topological defects, right, in the, in the heat. Thank you. And, and I have one more question, which is, you know, so, uh, so your uh, interaction terms are phenomenological, right? And I was wondering how easy or difficult it is to, you know, get the right parameters, which will give you, you know, the morphologies that we are seeing that mm -hmm. you can relate map back to, you know, appropriate, uh, exp the, you know, uh, you know, strengths of interactions mm -hmm. or other things in, 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 the, in the experiments, because you have a big multidimensional parameter space, right? So how did you go about getting, you know, deciding what your parameters are? All right. So, I mean, as I said, we went the other way around. We did not go from mechanistic description to phenomenological. We went from, okay, this is, seems to be a stable configuration in biology. What would be the potential that will result in this? And then okay. maybe the next step is then go and say, all right, so how, are, how can I go and back up my phenomenological potential by mechanistic interactions? And this, I think, is a very interesting exercise. It's definitely possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Silas, who is postdoc, he actually went to the lab of uh, uh, it's Axelord's lab at Stanford, where they look at the mechanism of PCP formation, how this planet cell polarity is induced, how it's propagating between cells. Mm -hmm. And I think basically that's kind of his plan to combine experiments and, and modeling then on a lower level mm -hmm. to go and back up these phenological potentials and interactions there. Mm -hmm. And of course, like finding the time scale of finding right collaborators where it could go and test you. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> your predictions, right? That's a, so we're in search and search for that for sure. Right, right, right. I mean, given of that, you have this model that works beautifully, right? Can you make predictions for other types of cells and systems, you know, that will then be borne out by experiments, right? So, right, right. So we're working at the moment, uh, the closest equivalent, because we'd like to work with systems that are easily manipulatable, right? right. In that sense, we're living in this very exciting era where you can do these organoids. So you can basically put a few stem cells in a dish and they make the rather complex structures with on many levels already similar to the organs, but still somewhat messed up. So the whole challenge in this field, how could you put maybe correct your cues and put right chemicals to drive them to the right structure? But for us as physicists, this is excellent experimental system where you can go and start pertur perturbing it in a more controlled way. So one such amazing system is um, um, gut organoids. Mm -hmm. and, and why they're amazing is because it seems like they actually generate just from a few stem cells, they generate these uh, organizer cells that secrete these organizing molecules uh, already in that system by itself. So they can self-organize to actually go and have the secretors, have these organizers, make the tube. And this system is amazing because it basically our gut and the system is recycled every 24 hours. Mm -hmm. 
but they have this kind of tube-like structures, a little bit like experimental tubes where you use in the chemistry, right? This would be your crypts. Uh, and the stem cells are at the bottom and they generate the proliferating very fast. So you keep the structure while the whole structure is being like the cells themselves, the material is being recycled very quickly, but the topology is preserved, right? So we feel it's like a very fascinating question of how can, 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 can we also challenge our model with that? Can, can this be, as, as people say, is, does the proliferation and apoptosis play a role? In that particular system, there is infinite amount of apoptosis and proliferation goes like crazy. Would that still be a stable uh, structure? So this is what we're working now. And uh, we basically got all the components to try to play with these organoids in the lab. We have a little lab where we test that. So it's just a question of um, right collaborators, right students, and, and uh, probing it there. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. I will stop recording at this point and